Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Leslie Subak. Great. Hello again. I hope you're enjoying your lunches. Um, they're certainly beautiful, and I, I actually have an open mind, but I can't wait. Um, so as I mentioned at the start, we'll be presenting information today that people clearly want and need to know. Information that's often not shared in your routine doctor visits, and information that remains taboo and sometimes is not shared with friends or family. Um, for that reason, I'll get right to introducing today's amazingly not taboo, amazing speaker, Dr. Karen Adams. So Dr. Adams joined us less than a year ago. She arrived from Oregon Health and Science University, um, where she is um, not only a national, but an international expert on menopause. Uh, she's doubly board certified in both obstetrics and gynecology and lifestyle medicine, which is a field that focuses on the power of lifestyle changes to prevent and treat chronic illness. She's also a Menopause Society certified menopause practitioner and a fellow of the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, which means she's also an expert in menopause and sex medicine. We recruited Dr. Adams to create and lead a new program in menopause and healthy aging here at Stanford. Um, today, she'll address sleep, mood, sex, weight, managing menopause, and other things that impact our health at midlife and beyond. As I say each of those things, I'm thinking we're gonna to need to have dinner here as well because <laughs> this is a big conversation. So, and Dr. Adams will be available after her presentation to take your questions about these and other topics, if there even are any. Um, please use your phone to scan the QR code that's on your table and submit any questions you have today. And we'll, our we'll do our best to get through as many as we can. Um, we also have many pre-submitted questions, and I think you'll be very excited about the questions and more excited about the answers. So thank you again for joining us. And now, Dr. Karen Adams. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Subak. Thank you to the Stanford Medicine Community Council uh, for, for just your brilliance to, to create something like this, to the community outreach departments, to the, the development groups at Stanford. You guys seriously have your finger on the pulse of something. Uh, of your constituency, because you guys, we broke the internet. <laughs> this event sold out in four hours, and three hours, uh, it was only actually open for three hours because one hour, the internet went down because so many people were trying to register. So there are about 350 people in this room. There are about 350 people on the wait list who could not get in here because the fire marshal wouldn't let us bring them in. <laughs> so, and we have about 80 pre-submitted questions. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this? It's, it's so clear that women and the people who love them are hungry for this information. There's so much misinformation out there and it's so hard to know what's real and what isn't real and what do we do? It's, it's super, super difficult and that's why I'm so happy to be here with you and today what we are gonna do is we are gonna explore what the science tells us about health and well-being in midlife, menopause, and beyond. So we are going to be grounded in evidence, we're gonna be grounded in science, and we are going to talk about all of those aspects and then whatever you all wanna talk about when we have the Q&A. So thank you so much for having me. Um, it's my delight and honor to be with you today. Um, as I go through the content, there are gonna be two themes that you will hear me come back to over and over and over again. The first one is set up your environment. 
so that it's easier for you to make the healthy choices that you want to make. You can do that. You can create that context, and you can create an environment that so that it's 8 o'clock at night and you're watching season two of Succession, and you don't have to make the right choice. You've already made the right choice for yourself. So you want to set up your environment so it's easier to make those choices. The other theme is the idea of good enough. Good enough, right? I mean, people are like, yeah. Because you know what? It's a journey, and we're not perfect. And we want to be our best selves most days. But on those other inevitable days when we're not our best self, it's important to be gentle with ourselves and to recognize that it's a journey. So don't let perfection keep you from being good enough. So those are the two themes that I'm going to kind of weave through this talk. The other thing, as Dr. Subak mentioned, the lifestyle medicine certification that I have, the board certification, really has taught me the power of our lifestyle choices. And now I'm a doctor, I know how to write drug prescriptions, and I am happy to have drugs when I need them because there are some things that you really need to treat with drugs. But the power of our lifestyle choices cannot be overemphasized. So I'm going to be talking about that as we go through. So as we start, what I want everybody in this room to do is just take a moment you can close your eyes if you feel comfortable. If you prefer, just soften your gaze. But take a moment and think about one thing that you are currently doing already to support your health. Everyone is doing something. Think about what you are doing to support your health. It might be your mental health. It might be your physical health. It might be emotional or spiritual health but everyone is doing something. So I want you to hold on to that thought as we go through the content. And as I talk about these different areas, you can open your eyes um, if you had them closed. <laughs> You're like, when do I open my eyes? <laughs> So as, as I talk about these different areas, see if your thing kind of hits in one of those areas. And remember, you know, you may not be doing it every day. You may not be doing it perfectly, but you're doing it, and it's good enough. So I hope the information I give you today is helpful for you on that journey. All right, so I have been at Stanford now about six months, a little bit longer than six months, and I took care of women in Portland, Oregon for 30 years. So I'm learning about my patients. And what I have I've done so far is I've seen about the number of women that are in this room in my clinic, in my menopause and healthy aging clinic. And so I'm learning about what people are like here in Stanford and where they're similar to the people at Port in Portland and where they're different. And I will tell you this, none of you are sleeping. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I am so impressed with how no one is sleeping. Nobody's sleeping. <laughs> and so, so I decided I was going to start this talk with sleep, because you guys need to hear this. So, so it's, um, it's interesting to me, because most of you tell me that you feel like your mood is pretty stable, and that you're not anxious or depressed. But when I say, how's your sleep? You go, oh my God, not at all, not at all. And so I suspect there is a degree of anxiety maybe in that. But is that so important? Yeah, it's important. Science tells us that if we are not sleeping well, your brain doesn't work. So you have brain fog, you get irritable, your focus, your concentration is all messed up. And guess what else happens? You have this pro-inflammatory markers that, that increase. And it increases your risk for chronic illness. So it increases your risk for dementia, for diabetes, for hypertension, for chronic cardiovascular disease. So not sleeping is not just that you're tired the next day. It's really impacting your health. So what can you do? This is the first time I'm going to say, set up your environment for success. 
So create a beautiful, cozy, beautiful place for you to go and sleep that you want to go to, to sleep at night. So put the blackout curtains up and get your cooling blanket or turn the thermostat down. Get some beautiful fuzzy blankets and pillows and create a space that you really want to go to. If you struggle with sleep, make sure that you go to bed at the same time and get up at the same time. Now, if you're sleeping great, sleep in on the weekend. I don't care. Go ahead, sleep in late. But if you're struggling with sleep, try to create that, that routine for yourself. And try not to nap, because if you nap, it just messes up your circadian rhythms. So go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time, and then what happens when you actually do wake up at night? Because we think it's normal in menopause to wake up twice a night to pee. And so, you know, people get up, they pee, they get back in bed. Then what happens? Can you fall back to sleep? Or do you lay there for two hours? Most of you lay there for two hours. And I would argue that it's not a headache or back pain or something like that that's keeping you awake. It's because you are making lists and you're thinking about what you're gonna do tomorrow and you're worrying about that project or you are going back over every stupid thing you ever said in your life and you're saying, I cannot believe they even put me on that committee, I'm such an idiot, and we torture ourselves. It's what the Buddhists call monkey mind. And it bounces around and it tortures us. I mean, we love our brains. Our brains make us who we are. But our brain also tortures us. And I suspect that's what's going on with all my really smart, active brain patients. So how do we manage that? The single most effective treatment for that kind of sleep disturbance, better than melatonin, better than Ambien, better than Trazodone, cognitive behavior therapy, CBT. Everybody should do CBT. You should do it, I should do it, my partner should do it, your partner should do it, our children should do it. It is an incredibly powerful tool to help us identify what they call cognitive distortions, meaning those thoughts that are just bouncing around in your head, catastrophizing, all or none, thinking, all these things that really torture us, that keep us awake at night. So CBT, especially if you combine it with some mindfulness practices like slow, deep breathing. If you breathe 10 times and you count those 10, 10 breaths, most people can't even be awake by the 10th breath. They're asleep. So I offer that to you as something to work with, that um, sleep disturbance, which is really impacting your life. Most of you really report a pretty stable mood. People aren't complaining of being anxious or depressed too much, except for one very specific group of people. And those are my perimenopausal patients. So menopause, the average age of menopause is about 51. The average transition time is about six to seven years and um, that's when you're the most symptomatic. So that's when you're starting to skip periods, when you're having hot flushes like crazy. And 68% of perimenopausal women have a thing called perimenopausal mood instability, PMI. 68%, that's more than have PMS. But we all know what PMS is, right? We talk about it all the time. Nobody's ever heard of PMI. And all of us, most of us have it. If you've never had a history of depression, you still have that 68% chance of having it. If you have a history of depression in college or postpartum depression, something like that, it's almost 100%. So it's incredibly, incredibly common. The best treatment for it is drugs. <laughs> so this is one of the areas that I really do recommend hormone stabilization. The reason this happens is because your hormones are so out of whack and they're not cycling in the way that they used to. And I tell you, when I talk to women about this and I say, you're not losing your mind, it's your hormones, people cry 
because they really think they don't know what's happening to them. So something hormonal that will stabilize those ups and downs is just really key to making your 40s you know, so much more manageable for you. Guess what the next best, or the best non-pharmacologic treatment is? Cognitive behavior therapy. Can I say this again? Everyone should do this. It really decreases the symptoms of mood disorders. And we have some amazing uh, resources at Stanford for people who do cognitive behavior therapy. And we have those programs. And some of those people are in the room here today. So seek that out. It's really, really important. Other sorts of things that can help. Um, you have a stabilized mood. Being in nature really has science to support it. It quiets the mind. It stops rumination. And then breathing practices, again, those slow, deep breaths, really can help decrease symptoms of anxiety, of insomnia, depression, PTSD. So all of those things, I, again, I offer those to you as things you might work with. The next thing that we know that science tells us really promotes health and well-being in midlife and beyond is consistent exercise. People who exercise have better sleep, they have better mood, they have better sex, they have better concentration. And so, and it really does decrease overall risk of chronic illness. So your risk for dementia goes down, your risk for diabetes, for hypertension, all of those things. So most of you are pretty good about that. Most people are doing something to kind of move their body. At least that's what I've found with my patients. But if you want an exercise prescription, I'll give it to you. Here's what science tells us is the most effective way to exercise. So 150 minutes per week of aerobic exercise. And it doesn't matter if you do it all on the weekend or if you divide it up during the week, but 150 minutes of aerobic exercise each week plus two episodes of strength training. And that can be yoga, it can be Pilates, it can be handheld weights. The reason that part is super important is because we have a thing that's called sarcopenia as we get older, where we lose our muscle mass and our muscles begin to get marbled with fat and they begin to shrink. And that's really important in terms of fall risk and uh, really being able to stay active as you move through your later years. So you want to do that strength training. The other part of that that's really important is making sure you get enough protein because we tend not to eat very much protein as we get older. And my, my benchmark for protein is about one gram per kilogram of body weight. So if you weigh 130 pounds, that's about 60 kilograms, and you need about 60 grams of protein each day. And we'll talk about where you might get that protein when we're talking about nutrition. So 150 minutes a week of, of aerobic exercise, uh, two episodes of strength training, and then the protein intake is super important. Having said all of that, any exercise is better than none. Good enough, right? Good enough. There is no minimum amount that has been shown to where benefit doesn't happen. And so if you just walk up a flight of stairs instead of taking the elevator, you get benefit from that. If you just get up from your desk and go outside and walk around the block, you get benefit from that. If you just say, you know, I can't get there today, but I'm going to drive by the gym. <laughs> and you say, I see you, Jim. I'm going to be there tomorrow. Good enough. If you show up to yoga class and all you do is lay in child's pose for an hour and sob into your mat, that's good enough. Good enough. Just show up. So don't make yourself crazy by trying to do too much. Just do whatever you can do. I want to take a moment and talk a little bit about the power of fulfilling sex in our quality of life. So our quality of life is really dictated by the quality of our sleep and the quality of our sex. And my menopausal patients struggle with both of those things. They're not sleeping and they're not having great sex. What happens in menopause is that 50% of us start to have pain 
with intercourse, when we have sex, with vaginal penetration. And so when you think about that, that would be half of the people in this room. 50% of people start having pain with sex when they go through menopause. Now, 50% don't, and I have a patient, she's 80 years old, she's having sex with two different men, no pain. <laughs> right? I know, I know, I know. I was like, you're my hero. <laughs> and she said, why not? So, yeah. <laughs> So not everybody has pain with sex, but um, if you do, oh my goodness, it's 100% treatable. It's not your new normal. Please run, don't walk to the menopause and sexual medicine program. We have experts on this and we can treat that. We can get that fixed. So first of all, fix pain. Second, the most common complaint that we have is low libido. You know, what most women complain of is, gosh, I wish I wanted it, but I just don't. I love my partner, I just don't really want it anymore. And that's actually really pretty easy to understand because our libidos naturally kind of decline after about four years in a new relationship. Everybody's kind of excited and interested. But after about four years, we kind of settle down. And the reason this happens is because all human sexual behavior, Men, women, the whole gender spectrum, everybody, is a balance of accelerators and brakes. And there are things that make us hit the accelerator, and there are things that make us hit the brake. And so often, especially as women, we feel like we need more accelerator. We think, you know, I need fancy lingerie, and I need a date night, and I need porn, and I need lube, and all these things, when in reality, so often, what it is, is we have to get our foot off the brake. And there are so many things that can make us hit the brake. You know, pain, I, absolutely, it's totally sane not to want to do something that hurts. But, you know, maybe she worked 70 hours that week. Or maybe her mom's visiting, and that kind of is creepy. And, uh, <laughs> or, you know, or maybe she's worried about her kids, or maybe she's got the flu and she's not feeling great. Or maybe, you know, her partner just came in from gardening and they're all sweaty and she likes them to be clean, you know? So it can be big things like major existential crises, or it can be, mm, you're kind of sweaty, I'm not too into it. So it can be big or small, but the point is, so often we think there's something wrong with us, something that needs to be fixed, when in reality so often it's just all this context that we're sort of swimming around in. So there's a very simple sex therapy technique that I just want to offer to you as something you might use to work with this a little bit, and it's called scheduled sex. Right? Which is funny, right? Because we think we should be swept away and have some, you know, big romantic moment, but not really in our lives, not the way our lives are. But what happens when you sit down with your partner and you say, come on, let's figure this out. I've got a light day on Thursday. Why don't we get, kind of get off work a little bit early? The kids are at sleepaway camp. Let's plan a, a bedroom date. What that does is a couple of things. One is it decreases the anxiety on the non-sex days, right? You know, that thing where you're just kind of pretending to be asleep when they come to bed and you hope that that arm doesn't come around. You know, that's not good. You don't want to, you don't want to do that. And so decreasing that anxiety, you're like, oh yeah, Thursday, we're going to have sex on Thursday. It just gives everybody a little breathing room. In addition to that, you can kind of pick the time that's going to work well for you. And then you can plan, you can kind of make sure you're showered and all of that. But the other cool thing it does is it raises endogenous testosterone levels. It makes your own testosterone levels go up. So it really works. So again, I offer that to you as just something kind of simple that you can try. There are some drugs for libido. Mm, you know, I'm kind of underwhelmed with them. We can talk about them a little bit in the Q&A, but really drugs don't work as well as these behavioral approaches. All right, we're gonna talk about weight management. Uh, yeah, menopause causes weight gain. And so if you eat exactly the same, exercise exactly the same, do everything you've always done, you will gain weight in menopause. 
I'm sorry to tell you it's true. It's not a ton. It's one and a half pounds per year. But for some people, it's a lot more than that. And it settles right here, right around your waist. So that happens just because of the metabolic changes and things that happen with aging. And exercise is good for so many reasons. But weight management is about what we're eating. And you cannot spend enough time on the treadmill to work off the calories in a bowl of pasta. Now, you can have pasta. You absolutely can have pasta. But if you eat it five times a week, you're going to be in trouble. So be aware and think about what we should be eating. Well, what should we be eating? Well, Michael Pollan has told us what we should eat. He says, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. So what does that look like, actually? So if you think about your plate, 50% of your plate is fruits and vegetables. A quarter of it is whole grains, and a quarter of it are beans, peas, and legumes. And if you ate like that all the time, you would eat no animal products, you would eat no meat, you would eat no dairy, and you would eat no eggs. You would be 100% vegan. Now, most of us can't do that, and we don't really want to do that. So here's good enough. So if you can do it a couple times a week, if you can have a couple days that you do that, you will drastically drop your risk for chronic illness. Your pro-inflammatory markers are going to decline. Your risk for dementia will go down. Your risk for hypertension, chronic diabetes, those things will all shift in a positive way. So the more you can get to that kind of goal of being vegan, that would be the thing to do. Now, you know, if you need that burger, you go have that burger and you enjoy it, enjoy it. But just know that this is kind of your goal. And this is also where you want to set up your environment for success. So you don't want to be opening bags and boxes and cartons. You don't want to be eating those kind of things. You want to eat whole food. So what does that look like? Well, an ear of corn is whole food. It's a whole food. Frozen corn kernels are sort of minimally processed. So that's fine. Corn chips? <laughs> no. No. Corn chips are what are, what are called edible food-like objects. <laughs> And so, and they have so much sodium in them. Your blood pressure is going to go up. They have additives that are going to hit the dopamine centers of your brain and make you crave them more. And they are going to increase your risk for chronic illness. So that's your goal. And remember, good enough. And there are drugs for weight loss. They have side effects. They don't work great. Um, but we can talk about them um, in the Q&A. Uh, but, you know, really behavioral change is really the mainstay of this. Managing menopause is super important because you have hot flushes, you have night sweats, you have mood changes, you have sleep disturbance and vaginal discomfort. All of these different symptoms kind of really hit in the late 40s, early 50s. So hot flushes in general last about five to seven years, if you say, nobody ever died from hot flushes. I think I'll just wait it out. You've got about seven years to wait it out. <laughs> That, so those are long years. And they create a lot of mood disturbance, sleep disturbance, that sort of thing. So um, we can treat that. This is an area where drugs are 100% effective. You know, yoga is not going to help your hot flushes the way estrogen will. So estrogen will take your hot flushes and night sweats away in about three to four weeks. And the only people who should not take estrogen are people who personally themselves have breast cancer, not your family history. But if you yourself have breast cancer, you probably shouldn't take estrogen. If you've had a heart attack or a stroke, you shouldn't. If you've had a blood clot in your leg or your lung or your brain. Those are the general categories of people who shouldn't take estrogen. And um, if you're under age 60 or less than 10 years out from menopause, you're a perfect candidate for it. So not only will you have symptom management, but 15 years from now, you're going to have better bones. You're going to have fewer bone fractures, better bone density, and you're going to have a healthier heart. So all of those things are factored in when we think about estrogen for folks. Uh, we have some wonderful, wonderful programs for our breast cancer patients at Stanford. 
and uh, we have a game changer drug for them now that just came out in the past year. It's called Fezolinitant, and it is a non-hormonal treatment for hot flushes, so it's really been wonderful to have that to offer. Also, genitourinary syndrome of menopause can affect the bladder as well as the vagina. We have some bladder docs in the audience today. So all of those things are part of menopause that you should come to us and get treated for. So my take home message is for you. What I want you to kind of hold in your mind and think back to the thing you thought of at the morning or at the beginning. Prioritize exercise, prioritize eating well, prioritize sex, prioritize sleep. Treat your menopausal symptoms, both for quality of life and also for long-term health. Set up your environment to make it easier to make good choices. Really think about that intentionally. And remember always that good enough is perfect. It's perfect, and there's always another opportunity to come around to that. Now, I saved the most important thing that we know about health, well-being, and longevity to the very end, and that is, you know what? It's not our blood pressure. It's not our cholesterol. It's our connections to other people that predict longevity. And that's why I'm so happy that the Stanford Community Council is creating this community for people because we need connection. It's so important to us. And we used to think it was marriage that was important. It's not. It's not marriage. It's being connected. And if you have a friend that you could call in the middle of the night if you got bad news or you were scared, you are more likely to live longer than if you didn't. So that connection is so important. And be careful about who you choose to be in your life, because friends influence each other, both negatively and positively. So you want your friends to be working on these things in the same way that you are, because they're going to support you and help you. So, so be aware of that. And the final thing <clears throat> that I'm going to leave you with is finding your sense of purpose. Why were you put on this earth? Because if you know that, if you know the answer to that question, you will always know that you're in the right place doing what you were meant to do. And that is really worth putting some time to think about. And for myself, I know that I dearly, dearly love my daughter. I dearly love my partner. I dearly love my family and my friends. But I was put on this earth and I know this in my bones, that I was put on this earth to support women. That's what I was born to do, and I've known that for decades. I have known that for years, that that's what I'm here to do. Thank you. And that is why I am so delighted to be right here, right now, with all of you, because the power in this room is palpable. And I just cannot wait to see where this all goes. So thank you so much. Oh my goodness gracious. I think we need a t-shirt that somehow is branded with Stanford Medicine that said, I was put on this earth to support women. Support women. Karen Adams, thank you. <laughs> Karen, that was just fantastic. Um, your unfiltered discussion um, about topics that sometimes you don't talk about is so appreciated. And every time I hear you speak, I honestly learn so much more that I can't wait to then take out and share with all of my patients. Um, I love how you destigmatize de a lot of the topics that you've discussed. And um, I know from talking with Karen that there are so many, um, there's so much uh, texture that comes in mm -hmm. with each of the topics that you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. So without me chatting too much more, I want to get on to the many questions that we have um, that I will share with you. I've got an iPad to help make this easier. So. What is the age cutoff to begin hormone replacement therapy? Has that ship sailed if I'm over 65? Is there anything else I can do? Mm -hmm. We did touch on this, but. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you know, the ideal is under age 60 or less than 10 years out from menopause. So it's either or. So if your menopause didn't hit, your periods didn't stop until you were 55, you still have a 10-year window there. But we know that if you start hormones after that, that it destabilizes the plaques in our coronary arteries, and so the risk-benefit balance really tips toward risk. And so, um, and it's really unfortunate because there's a whole generation of providers that went through medical training and didn't get taught how to take care of menopausal people. And so it's incredibly difficult to find someone who can help you, and a lot of people missed the window. And so a big part of what we're doing in, the, in our program is educating other providers so that it won't be so difficult to find someone who can um, help you with this. But yeah, I mean, I hate to say the ship has sailed because you still have so much control over your risk factors, you know, with the things we talked about. But hormones per se, probably not a good idea after age 60 or longer than 10 years out from menopause to start. Now, continuing is a little bit of a different story. We actually don't have the data to tell us at what age people should stop hormones, but we know that um, starting them de novo at 65 or older is really different from starting at age 50 and then just continuing. So it's always a risk-benefit discussion. We get people in once a year. We talk over what's going on and decide whether to continue it or not. Okay. Fabulous. <clears throat> and this talks a little bit more about the brain. I worry that lack of sleep post-menopause puts me at higher risk for dementia or Alzheimer's. Is it safe to start hormone therapy um, late past 60 to help protect my brain? But let's just say, does hormone therapy help protect your brain? Right, right. I mean, dementia is one of those things that's so real for us. Women are much more likely to get dementia than men. And people talk to me about this a lot. They're like, what can I do to protect my brain? The data about hormones and dementia is mixed. And so we do know that if you start hormones after age 65, it actually doubles your risk of dementia. So, so never, never, never start it after age 65. Uh, things you can do to decrease your risk for dementia are don't smoke, minimize your alcohol intake, exercise, plant-based diet, if you have chronic illness, treat it. Make sure your blood pressure is treated. Make sure your blood sugar is treated, is in the proper range if you're diabetic. And guess what the other one is? Social connections. Stay connected to the people that you love. They will keep you healthy. When you said guess what the other one was, I thought it was going to be have sex because that oh, seems to be on the list. Have sex. <laughs> that's okay. Good sex. <clears throat> okay. So, yeah. do women on hormone replacement therapy experience less weight gain than women who go through menopause with no hormones? Yeah, great question. Um, hormone therapy does mitigate the weight gain a little bit. In particular, what it does is it has small but measurable benefits in terms of lean body mass and in terms of your body weight distribution. So the answer to that is yes. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, my husband and I are in, our, are in our late 60s. We have a loving marriage, but we haven't had sex in years. Is this abnormal? Totally. No, <laughs> not really. <laughs> No, not at all. I mean, you know, it's only a problem if it's a problem for you, you know? And a lot of people kind of settle into a, a comfortable relationship where they don't have sex. And I'm not going to tell you that's wrong if that works for you. I do know that orgasm actually changes our brain chemistry for about 24 hours. It, it releases endorphins. It makes pain easier to manage. So there are some real benefits to having sex. But it, you know, uh, it, you do you. So, uh, so if it's not part of your priority list, that's okay. That's not abnormal. Great, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. How can I talk to and prepare my family for perimenopause and menopause? Mm -hmm. And I have to say, in several conversations I had before we started, um, many women suggested talking to their husbands or spouses, educating men, and men want to know more about this. So I'll just put that out there. But how can we prepare 
ourselves and our families for perimenopause and menopause. Right, right. I think we have to prepare ourselves first by coming to events like this so you know what the heck is going on. Because people come into me and they, they don't know. They think they're losing their mind. So educate yourself. And that is a, that's hard to do because there's so much misinformation in this space. There are so many people out there touting all kinds of things. And that's where I think we can really be useful here at Stanford. Uh, but once you've educated yourself, then it's really important to make sure that you have talked about this with your family, with your, with, you know, I see couples, people come in to, to see me together. And I love that when the partner is asking as many questions as well. And it's really important because there was a very interesting study that was done by a PhD candidate looking at the benefit of educating partners about what women were going through. And they found that the women actually had better management of their symptoms. And so it is really important. I think that's a great idea. We should, we should do this next year full of, with partners. And that, have it be a That's a great idea. Thing. That would be fun. Great. And is it safe to resume having sex if it's been a while? It's, it's normal to say, wow, I wonder if everything will work or, or you know. And I, I think, I guess... Sex is supposed to be fun, right? It's supposed to be adult play. It's supposed to be joyful, but we worry about it, and it, and you know, we have anxiety about it. And um, and I think it's really important to number one, maintain your sense of humor, and uh, you know, because one of the things that really predicts a healthy sex life is. Um, is psychological health because you have to be willing to make funny faces and weird noises and all kinds of things and not agonize over that too much. So, um, so I think what I would say is first of all, just you know, kind of take it with a grain of salt. Realize it's not one and done, and that hopefully you'll have opportunities. Realize that you have a 50/50 chance of having pain, and so you might think about getting a vibrator or something and just practicing a little bit to see if you can insert something in the vagina without pain. And then if you have pain, get that treated. And be sure to use a really good lubricant. Lubricant is super important. You can get STDs after menopause, STIs. So be careful about that. Coconut oil is my favorite lubricant, but it will break down a latex condom. And so you need to use a non-latex condom if you're going to use coconut oil. So, But be thinking about STIs as well, because you can get them when you're 70 or 80, so I talked to my 80-year-old patient about that. So <laughs> using condoms. <laughs> well, she has two partners, so that yeah, I was like, do they it. know about so, each other? So, so it, <laughs> as you said, coconut oil, a whole bunch of faces were like, ugh, because oh. they're thinking about that gloppy stuff in a jar. So talk right. a little bit more about coconut oil. Yeah, please. so coconut oil is my favorite lubricant. It's cheap and it smells great, but it's also naturally antifungal, so it will tend to keep down yeast infections, makes the vaginal pH more normal. And it's very slippery. It stays where you put it. It doesn't absorb into your body the way a water-based lubricant will. Um, and it's um, kind of waxy at room temperature. So Trader Joe's has a jar of it. They're not paying me to talk about this. Um, <laughs> or Costco. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> right. <laughs> Next year, we'll take a poll and see what yeah, people like. Yeah, we'll give you goodie bags of, <laughs> of coconut oil. And so, so uh, yeah. I could go off on that. So there's um, there's a jar, and you you know you you don't want your kitchen coconut oil to be your bedroom <laughs> coconut oil. So buy two jars. One's in the bedroom, one's in the kitchen. But it's the same stuff, and it's kind of waxy at room temperature. So you melt it on your hands. You put some on your partner, some on you. You can even take a little glob and insert it into the vagina and let it melt. It also comes in oil, and that's fine. Um, and the the goal is to really decrease friction. You don't want rug burns. You don't want tissue tearing. You don't want anything like that. But people often will call me and they'll say, okay, I'm using coconut oil. It's slippery, but it still hurts. So dryness and pain are two different things. So if it's slippery, but it still hurts, you need to get that treated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, how do I get through my doctor's bias against hormone replacement therapy to have a real discussion about whether it's the right choice for me? Mm -hmm. So true, so true. You know, again, there's a whole generation of providers that were not trained, and, um, and we don't like to 
and enter into areas that we don't feel competent. And so I, I don't blame them. They weren't trained. And uh, but if you try to raise the conversation and they shut you down, you know, don't deny what you know to be true. And that's in general a rule for life. Don't be with a partner who denies what you know to be true. And when you know something and you know that it's true for you, then find the person who will support you in that, in every area of your life. And we are doing our best to train those providers so it won't be so hard for you to find them. Excellent. Um, my libido has slowly decreased since menopause, and I've heard that testosterone can help. Is it safe to take oral testosterone or use a cream, and will it really improve my sex life? Mm, great question. You know, testosterone has come before the FDA for women four times, and they keep turning it down. And they say, well, you know, we think it's going to be negative lipid, lipid effects. It's going to make people's cholesterol go up. Oh, my gosh. Viagra can cause blindness, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and it got approved. <laughs> so, totally so, different. I mean, I'm not holding my breath waiting for an FDA-approved version of testosterone, which is too bad. The data, there was a, a huge article that came out in 2018 looking at the world's data on testosterone in women. And what they found is in postmenopausal women, not premenopausal women, but in postmenopausal women, it's effective. It increases desire, arousal, orgasm and satisfaction by a tiny little bit. So it's not like a magic bullet, but it does seem to work a little bit. But we don't have an FDA approved version for it. It's a bit of a project to use it because what we have to do is get a blood level, then we give you one tenth of the male dose. So there are national guidelines now about how to do this for women. And we, we order the male dose, but there, the pharmacy will give you a box of 32 and a, one tube is a one-day dose for a man. It's, uh, it's uh, 10 days for women. So you're doing one-tenth. You have to squirt it into a syringe, squirt out half a cc, rub it on the back of your thigh, and wash your hands, and then we have to get blood levels again. So it's a bit of a project. Um, and really, scheduled sex works just as well. So, so you know, those other kind of... of um, approaches are important. Sex therapy is a real thing. And uh, there are people who have mental health training in addition to two to three extra years of training, learning to treat sex as a true therapeutic goal and not just a symptom of something else, like, oh, you must be depressed, or oh, you must have relationship issues. So we have great sex therapy resources in the Bay Area as well. And so I would, I would encourage you to really address this if this is happening for you, because it changes. It changes the dynamic. And in fact, I had a couple sitting in my office, and the man was with his wife. And he said to her, you know, being in bed with you is the loneliest place in the world. And she started to cry. And he started to cry, and I started to cry. <laughs> We're all crying. And she said, oh. I'm so sorry, I, I didn't realize. And so, because that person who's be, always being rejected um, is suffering too. So I forget what the question was, but, <laughs> that, <laughs> but anyway. No more questions, you just riff, it'll be perfect. Okay. But, it, but so, you know, that imbalance, that desire imbalance is hard for couples, and I really encourage you to, to address that. Be oh, that's uh, sex therapy, because there's ways to treat it. And, and again, we have a lot of expertise about that at Stanford. Mm. Wonderful. What is the one thing a woman in her 40s should start to do to make her perimenopause and menopause an easier experience? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's educate yourself. And I keep coming back. I'm so passionate about mm -hmm. education and really find those those evidence-based, science-backed resources that can help you figure out what is going on. Because you could have perimenopausal mood instability, but you could also have major depression. And you need to be able to kind of, uh, you know, navigate those changes and have a, a team, a partner that will help you figure that out. So I would say, uh, you know, we hope, stay tuned, we hope that we will be having podcasts, that we will be having newsletter 
content that we can be your source for good, solid information so that you can take that and use it for your own your lives and the lives of the people you love. And how long do I need to use contraception after I have my last period? Some websites say one to two years, exclamation point. Depends on how much you don't want to get pregnant. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, you know, realistically, you know, Clint Eastwood could have a baby when he, was, when he was 75 because his sperm are six weeks old. Men's sperm are six weeks old. We are born with all the eggs we're ever going to have. So my eggs are 65 years old. I guarantee you no baby's coming from that. And so, so because as we age, our ovaries age. And so what that means is that when you have unprotected sex and you're older, you're much less likely to get pregnant, and if you do, you're highly likely to miscarry because the chromosomes don't line up and, it, and it's, um, it's not likely to take. So the odds of getting pregnant after 50, if you're still having periods, are very low, but they are not zero. And so certainly, if you're still having periods, you need contraception. But once your periods have stopped, and the definition of menopause is no period for a year, and we only know that in the rear view mirror, right? We, you don't know when you're having that last period. So a year would be, would be really to be the safest. And is it recommended not to drink alcohol during menopause? <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Well, there's no recommendations that say to drink alcohol, basically. So, so you know, um, one, one of the questions that popped up was about the blue zones. You know, the blue zones are parts of the world where they have the highest percentage of people who live to be 100. And one of the aspects of blue zones is moderate to minimal alcohol intake. But it's usually within the context of socialization and family and connection, those things that are so important. Important. So, uh, so uh, there's no amount of alcohol that we say is safe. What we know about alcohol is that it does increase your risk of breast cancer more than estrogen does. So, so the risk of breast cancer goes up if you drink more than seven glasses of wine a week. And, and it doesn't matter if you drink them all on the weekend or one every night, whatever, but, but if you do more than seven a week, your risk of breast cancer goes up. So we have, to, we have to be aware of that. There's only one blue zone in the United States. Does anybody know where that is? Loma Linda, of course you know where, where it is. Loma Linda. And the reason the blue zones have this, this increased lifespan is because they have a plant-based diet and they tend to incorporate physical activity into their general routine rather than going to the gym. They just walk everywhere. They minimal alcohol intake, no smoking, and then all the rest of it is connection. It's all connection. So, um, so you know, I, I encourage you to, there's a website called The Blue Zones, and it's got recipes and all sorts of things. It's really fascinating, fascinating, yeah. And are GLP-1 medications like Ozempic, which we hear about all yeah. over the place, recommended to address menopausal weight gain? Well, again, recommended. You know, there was, I, you probably saw that article in the New York Times that said Ozempic is going to be the solution to menopausal weight gain. And it does seem to work, you know. Um, it's difficult because access is hard. It's very expensive. Um, a lot of people pay for it out of pocket. Um, the, there's manufacturing uh, holds up, hold up, so it's hard to get it. Um, but it does seem to be effective. There are some downsides to it. Um, it's a lifelong commitment. Um, if you go off of it, people tend to gain the weight back. There are a lot of GI side effects. People often have a lot of nausea and vomiting. There's some additional uh, concerns about suicidality and potential hair loss. So, so there are some side effects. But, uh, but, you know, for some people, it's the right solution when they've done all the other things and it hasn't really budged. The indications for it are people with a BMI over 30 or people with a BMI over seven, or 27 with comorbidities, meaning sleep apnea or hypertension or diabetes or something like that. So as that data continues to evolve, we're watching that because for some people, it is the right solution. Thank you. <clears throat> And can hormone replacement therapy raise blood pressure? 
if you have a history of high blood pressure, is it safe to take estrogen? It is, it is. You know, um, uh, hormone therapy in people who have normal blood pressure tends to lower blood pressure a little bit. So we see a little bit of a drop in people who have normal blood pressure and in people who have well-controlled hypertension, it does not seem to, to make that any worse. If you have uncontrolled hypertension, then I would not do hormone therapy until you get your hypertension under control. And after everything we've heard today, is there a way to delay menopause? <laughs> Why would you want to? <laughs> really, there's a thing called menopausal zest, you know? And when I lecture about this at the medical school, the medical students are like, Bleh, this sounds terrible, you know? Because they're, what are they, 20, 14? How old are medical students? <laughs> <Younger. anymore? laughs> they all look so young to me. Um, but I tell them, you know, in, the, in big population studies, when women are on the other side of menopause, they rate their satisfaction with their relationships, with their work life, with their family, with themselves, higher than they ever have. You know what the decade is when people are the most unhappy? in their 20s. It's so hard, right? You're trying to figure out who you are and where are you gonna work and who are you gonna marry and where are you gonna live and all that. It's so hard. And then people get happier and then there's a little dip in the 40s when people have kind of a midlife crisis. And then after that, people just get happier and happier and happier. And the good news is your 60s are great, your 70s are better, 80s apparently are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Karen. So, and finally, for all the efforts to improve gender equity over the past century, the gap between men's and women's health remains very wide. Uh, that's one of the main reasons I wanted to bring you here to Stanford to transform how we approach menopause and healthy aging by developing a dedicated program. Can you tell us a bit more about your plans to develop this dedicated program? I'd love to, yes. So the idea of the program, the Menopause and Healthy Aging Program, is really a center without walls. So it is, uh, it's not that we put all the people in the same building, because there's gonna be too many of us. There are a lot of people doing this work at Stanford. It's the idea that we become a destination for science-based, evidence-based menopause care and healthy aging. So that's really what I'm super excited about, bringing all the pieces that are already in place at Stanford to create that. So it really is based on four pillars. The program has four pillars, and I think we have a slide about it. They are, um, research, advocacy, education, and clinical care. And I've told you why I'm so passionate about the education piece of it, because it's so important that we have opportunities like this to educate you, but also to educate the people who are taking care of you. So that's a big part of our mission. Um, in addition to that, yes, women's health is the most over-legislated and underfunded um, area of health. Oh. Yeah, so we have so much work to do there. We really want to bring that, the knowledge forward. We want to advocate for more research dollars so that we can move that conversation forward. We know more. There's just so much opportunity there. So I've been at Stanford for about six months, and one of the big things I've been doing is going around meeting people who are doing work in various realms, and many of them are in the room here today. And I wanna just thank you so much for coming and being a part of this, because together we are building a rocket ship, and it's going to be fantastic. So some of you have faculty at your, at your table, but the, would the Stanford faculty please raise their hands and just, and just take a... So that has just been really fun to go around and meet people and see what great work people are doing and thinking about the synergies that we can put together. Because menopause has for so long, for too long, been under-recognized, under-diagnosed, under-treated, under-funded. And so what we really wanna do is create a destination place. And I think we have all the 
place all the opportunities here to do that. So if this sounds exciting to you, we would be thrilled to talk to you because we are very much kind of in the seed stage right now. And I've only been here six months, but we are already working on a lot of those pillars. And um, really, the sky's the limit. There's so much opportunity here. So um, do talk to us if you're interested in this. And again, it's just my absolute pleasure to be here with you. I feel like I'm in the right place at the right time. Yeah, so Great. thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Karen, for sharing your vision with us. Um, it's so inspiring. And I want to echo that philanthropic support will help us quickly advance our vision. Um, so we're very excited to work with, with any of you who are willing to share in that vision and, and help us. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us here today. Uh, we so appreciate your interest and enthusiasm for the topic. Um, we hope to, that you continue these discussions as you leave with your friends, with your family, um, within your communities. Um, we'll provide a recording of today's program to everyone who attended. Please share it liberally. Um, knowledge and education are the things that are going to help us the most in our 40s, but also through our, our 90s. Um, thanks again for your participation. Um, there's coffee and tea that's outside. Please travel safely, stay well, and bless you all. Thank you. Thank you.